Picture this, it is 3 a.m. in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. A 19-year-old sailor from Ohio is standing on the flight deck of a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier. He is barely out of high school. He is wearing a yellow jersey. He is fighting to stay standing on a piece of steel pitching in 15-foot swells. He is not the pilot. The pilot is an officer strapped into the cockpit. But that 19-year-old has the power of life and death in his hands. His job? To use hand signals to guide that $70 million FA-18 Super Hornet onto a catapult track or a parking spot the size of a Walmart parking lot. It is dark. The noise is physical, a vibration that rattles your chest. One wrong hand signal from the kid on the deck and the jet slams into the barrier. Or it skids off the edge into the abyss. The pilot dies. The $70 million asset is gone and the 5,000 people sleeping below deck are in danger. This happens every single night. Young enlisted sailors directing the movement of machines worth more than they will earn in their entire lives. And right now, the United States operates exactly 11 of these floating cities. Not 10, not 12. Exactly 11. Why? Most people assume it is about firepower, or maybe it is just what the Pentagon could afford but the real answer is way more interesting and terrifying than that. The number 11 is the result of brutal mathematics that almost nobody outside the military understands. Here is the paradox that keeps admirals awake at night. When the Navy says they have 11 carriers, what they really mean is, we need 11 total so that three can actually be deployed. That is the margin of error. Today, we are going to break down the death spiral that happens when you subtract just one ship. We will take you inside the dry docks where these monsters are literally cut in half, and we will show you why the safety of the global economy hangs by a thread called number 11. If you are proud of the men and women keeping that thread intact, type proud in the comments right now. Let us do the math. To understand why 11 is the magic number, you have to understand that an aircraft carrier is not just a ship. It is a biological organism that gets tired. It is a floating city with a population bigger than thousands of American towns. And these cities run on a brutal cycle that never stops. The Navy calls it the Optimized Fleet Response Plan. We will call it the Rule of Thirds. Imagine three buckets. Bucket one, the tip of the spear. Right now, roughly three carriers are actually at sea in combat zones. Ships like the USS Abraham Lincoln or USS Harry S. Truman. These ships are actively working. Jets launching every few minutes. 6,000 people living in a space smaller than a shopping mall. They are watching China's movements near Taiwan. They are protecting the shipping lanes that carry 20% of the world's oil. They are the only thing standing between stability and chaos. Bucket 2, the pulse check. Another three to four carriers are back in the United States. They look ready. They are floating at the pier. But they are not combat ready. The air wing is requalifying. Pilots who have been on shore duty are relearning the insane art of carrier landings. The deck crew is drilling on aircraft handling. In an absolute emergency, a World War III scenario, these ships could surge forward, but for day-to-day -day operations, they are effectively offline. Bucket three, the graveyard shift. The last three to four carriers are in maintenance. And when I say maintenance, I do not mean an oil change. I mean ships that are completely torn apart in dry dock. No crew, no aircraft, no ability to respond to anything. These ships might as well not exist. They are floating construction sites in Virginia and California. Now, do the math with me. 3 deployed, plus 4. Training plus 4. Broken equals 11. Wait, that leaves zero margin for error. The 11th carrier is the insurance policy. It is the only buffer the United States has. Without that 11th carrier, the entire system collapses. Let me show you what collapse looks like. France operates one nuclear aircraft carrier, the Charles de Gaulle. Beautiful ship. But every seven years, it needs an 18-month maintenance period. During those 18 months, France has zero aircraft carriers. None. Their ability to project power disappears. 
the United Kingdom has two carriers. But in 2022, when the HMS Prince of Wales broke a propeller shaft and the other carrier was in port, the Royal Navy, once the ruler of the waves, had effectively zero carrier capability. America cannot afford that. To keep just three ships watching the world, we need eight others in the pipeline backing them up. But what happens when you try to cheat the math? The US Navy tried it recently, and it was a catastrophe. In December 2012, the Navy made what seemed like a reasonable decision. They retired the USS Enterprise, the oldest carrier in the fleet. The problem? The replacement was not ready yet. For five years, America operated with 10 carriers instead of 11. Just one less. Pentagon planners told Congress it would be fine. They would stretch the schedules, make it work. They were catastrophically wrong. Here is what happens to the human beings inside the machine when the math breaks. Aircraft carriers operate 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. There are no weekends, no holidays, no downtime. When you have 11 carriers, a deployment lasts about seven months. When you drop to 10, the ship currently at sea cannot come home because there is no replacement ready to take its place. Seven months became nine months, then 10 months. Imagine you are a sailor. You live in a birthing compartment with 60 to 100 other people. You sleep in a rack, a bunk stacked three high measuring just 72 inches long and 26 inches wide. It is smaller than a prison cell. You have 20 inches of space above your face. You share a bathroom where four showers serve 100 people. Now imagine doing that for 300 days straight without seeing your family. The death spiral began. Sailors started calling home with bad news. Honey, I am not coming home in June. It looks like October. Marriages fell apart. Divorce rates among carrier crews spiked. Kids grew up not recognizing their parents. Experienced chief petty officers, the people who know how to run the nuclear reactors and the flight decks, resigned. They walked away because the schedule became unsustainable. Fighter pilots, who cost taxpayers $10 million each to train, quit to fly for commercial airlines. Why? Because Delta Airlines lets you sleep in a real bed, not a coffin locker. But the human cost was just the beginning. The ships themselves started breaking. Carriers pushed beyond their maintenance cycles developed stress fractures. Catapults failed. Electrical grids shorted out. When these worn out ships finally limped back to port, they needed longer maintenance periods than planned because they had been driven so hard. A scheduled six-month repair turned into 10 months. This created a gap. In 2015, for weeks at a time, there was no U.S. aircraft carrier in the Persian Gulf. The Mediterranean sat empty. Adversaries like Iran and Russia saw the gaps. They knew when America was stretched thin. This is the cost of just one less ship. It is not a statistic. It is a strategic failure. Now you might be asking, why are three or four carriers always broken? Can we not just fix them faster? Welcome to the nightmare known as RCOH, Refueling and Complex Overhaul. This is the most expensive, dangerous, and time-consuming pit stop in the world. Here is the reality of nuclear power. The reactors on a Nimitz or Ford-class carrier are marvels of American engineering. They can run for over 20 years without refueling. But at the 25-year mark, the fuel runs out. You cannot just pull up to a pump. To refuel a carrier, you have to take it to Newport News Shipbuilding in Virginia. This is the only place in America capable of building these nuclear giants. They put the ship in a dry dock and drain 100 million gallons of water. Then they do the unthinkable. They literally slice through the ship's massive steel hull. They do not just scrub the floors. They rip out the nuclear guts of the ship to access the reactor compartments deep inside. The ship was built from the keel up as one continuous structure, and now they have to surgically cut into it. It is like performing open-heart surgery on a skyscraper. While the ship is cut open, they replace every radar and every computer. They replace miles of cabling and resurface the flight deck. This process takes four years. Four years where that $13 billion asset is a motionless pile of steel. Right now, as you watch this, a carrier like the USS John C. Stennis is sitting in Virginia, 
completely useless to the fleet. It is a $13 billion paperweight. You cannot speed this up. Why? Because you are dealing with radioactive material. One mistake does not just mean a delay, it means a nuclear incident. The workforce required to do this is specialized beyond belief. These are not just construction workers. They are nuclear certified craftsmen. You cannot just hire more people off the street to work faster. So the math remains brutal. Every carrier spends 15% of its life, four solid years, completely offline. If you have 11 carriers and one is always in RCOH, you really only have 10 functional ships. And as we just proved, 10 is not enough. So why not just build 12 or 13? Give the fleet some breathing room? If 11 is the bare minimum, why do we not build a safety margin? The answer tells you everything about America's industrial reality. During the Cold War, America had multiple shipyards that could build carriers. Today, there is exactly one. Huntington Ingalls Industries in Newport News, Virginia. That is the only spot on the map with a dry dock big enough and a workforce skilled enough to build a nuclear supercarrier. If a hurricane hits that shipyard or a major fire breaks out, America loses the ability to build carriers, period. And that single shipyard is already maxed out. Building a carrier takes nearly a decade. The USS John F. Kennedy was floated in 2019, but it takes years of outfitting before it is ready to fight. Even if Congress wrote a blank check today for a 12th carrier, it would not arrive until the late 2030s. By then, the oldest ships in the fleet will need to retire. We are not building fast enough to grow. We are barely building fast enough to stay the same. And then there is the cost. A Ford-class carrier costs $13 billion. But a carrier never travels alone. It needs a strike group, destroyers, cruisers, submarines, and supply ships. Then you need the aircraft, an F-35C, C costs $100 million. An air wing is billions more. To add just one more carrier strike group to the rotation would cost roughly $50 billion up front. That is the entire GDP of a small country like Jordan or Tunisia, just to add one ship. In a world of budget fights and inflation, 11 is the ceiling. It is all the system can support. The number 11 is not just about budgets. It is written into federal law because of a specific nightmare scenario. The two-war standard. The U.S. military is designed to be able to fight a major war in one theater while holding the line in another. Imagine this. China invades Taiwan. The U.S. Navy surges four carriers to the Pacific to respond. At the exact same moment, seeing the U.S. distracted, Iran closes the Strait of Hormuz, choking off the world's oil supply. You need at least two carriers in the Middle East to reopen those lanes. Now do the math with our buckets. Total fleet, 11. In maintenance, RCOH, four, unavailable. That leaves seven. You send four to China, you send two to the Middle East. That leaves one carrier. One single ship to cover the Mediterranean, the Atlantic, and the rest of the globe. If you only had 10 carriers, you would have zero reserves. You would have to choose. Do we save Taiwan or do we save the oil supply? You could not do both. This is not hypothetical. In October 2024, when Houthi rebels started firing missiles at cargo ships in the Red Sea, the USS Dwight D. Eisenhower was already there. It did not have to be scrambled from halfway around the world. It was on station. Within hours, FA-18s were launching from its deck intercepting missiles and protecting the global economy. That is what 11 carriers looks like when the math works. It is about having a ship already there when the world catches fire. But we cannot talk about strategy without talking about the cost paid by the people inside the steel. We mentioned the coffin lockers. We mentioned the divorce rates. But consider the sheer physical scale of what these crews do to keep us safe. Every single day, the crew of a carrier prepares and serves over 17,000 meals. They bake fresh bread while the ship is rolling in the ocean. They process waste for 5,000 people. They sleep in bunks stacked three high, with the noise of catapults slamming into the deck just a few feet above their heads. 
The newest carrier, the USS Gerald R. Ford, has tried to make life better. It has gender-neutral bathrooms and better air conditioning, but it is still a warship. When a sailor signs up, they are volunteering to leave the world behind. They miss birthdays. They miss Christmases. They live in a world of steel and gray paint. And they do it so that you do not have to worry about whether the shipping lanes are open or if a conflict is going to spiral into World War III. The number 11 is determined by industrial capacity and nuclear physics. But it is also determined by human endurance. 11 carriers allow for seven-month deployments. That is hard, but survivable. Drop to 10 carriers, and you break the people. And if you break the people, it does not matter how many $13 billion ships you have, they will not sail. So why does America need exactly 11 aircraft carriers? Because 11 is the brutal mathematical minimum. It allows for three carriers always deployed, watching our rivals, three carriers training, ready to surge, and five carriers in the shop, getting the open heart surgery they need to survive. It is not 10 because we tried that, and it nearly destroyed the fleet. It is not 12 because we cannot build them fast enough. 11 is the floor. It is the compromise between what strategy demands and what reality allows. The next time you see an aircraft carrier on the news, launching jets or returning from deployment, do not just see a big boat. Remember the incredible human story inside. Remember the 19-year-old on the flight deck in the pitch black. Remember that at that exact moment, that ship is one of only three that are truly ready to fight. That is how thin the margin is. That is why the number 11 matters. If this breakdown opened your eyes to the hidden math of military power, hit that like button. It helps us tell more stories about the heroes who defend our freedom. Until next time, stay proud.